discovered that really there was very little known about this kind of process that I use, and so I then decided to write this book, at least to be to be to inform the general public, and hopefully other people would do the type of work that I have been doing. But I found it very beneficial, uh, particularly for people who are alcoholics, on drugs, criminals, violent people, a um, whole host of, of abnormal, or abnormalities, even schizophrenics. Um, this has been very effective, this kind of work that's being done here. I think the first thing I must do is try to, to have you understand a little bit about the spirit world. The spirit world is, of course, is where all these uh, entities are that cause trouble to the living. And so I think we should understand a little bit about what's happening over there. First of all, from many accounts that I've read and, and people I've talked to, the dying process is generally a sort of a universal, has a universal similarity. If a person is in the hospital or in bed without uh, drugs and dies, the soul or the spirit seems to lift up and look down and say, hmm, I don't like that, that kind of a body. That's an awful looking thing. I'm glad I'm not in there. Not realizing at the time that that's them. And then they will hear people about them, but uh, if it's a normal progression, at some period of time, they will see their entire life pass in front of them. And this can be very fast, because there's no such thing as time on the other side. And it gives a person an opportunity to see what they came here to do, what they did not accomplish, what they did accomplish, what has yet to be done. And then, almost all of them will describe as going through what has appeared to be a dark tunnel. At the end of the tunnel is a bright, warm, loving light. And they'll, be, they'll gravitate toward this light. They'll get into this light and they'll feel as if they're in the presence of, many of them describe as presence of God. There they will meet those who've gone before them, those who are, who are uh, that they love, those who are, they have a great deal of of, of uh, uh, appreciation for, and they will then be taken by these people and continued on their road to spirituality. In other words, we're all progressing, trying to become a little bit more aware, more whole as whole persons uh, on this earth, and this continues, the process continues as we go on the other side. Now, on that other side there, there's no such thing as time, and they have some very interesting uh, 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 laws. There's instant communication there. When someone thinks of somebody, that person is drawn to them. And so there is a complete and an immediate commun communication. It's not done by the voice, it's done totally by telepathic means. So if you have a problem with a language problem, you don't have any problem. You can simply communicate. In fact, as I have found that myself, when I am talking to somebody or trying to talk to somebody who speaks a different language entirely, and I haven't, don't, know what, don't know one word of it, what I will do is to relax myself and then listen, say, as, I, as I say, with the inner ear, and I can understand the person pretty well, what he's talking about. And this is the way they communicate over there. In other words, you try to lie, you don't get away with it over there. Um, our beliefs here on this earth largely determines what's going to happen to us immediately after we die. If we believe there is nothing for us, that we go in a hole and that's all, then there is usually darkness. There is, we find very little, we, we are lost. And we oftentimes don't progress as we should. If we have a strong attachment for something, a person, a lot of money, um, maybe um, a cause of some sort, that will hold you on this earth. You become, in a sense, earthbound. You don't progress anymore. You are here, 
You may not be a very bad sort of a person. Certainly you don't change. You won't change at all. You'll want to continue doing what you did in the past. Now, generally these people are okay, but occasionally you have a troublemaker, and these troublemakers are usually very negative in character. And when they possess a person, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how it's done, they cause a lot of trouble, an awful lot of trouble. They commit murders, they, they, they commit all kinds of crimes, and particularly they give an awful hard time to the people living with them, living with the person who's possessed. Very interesting uh, um, story was told by told me by Edith Fiore. Edith, Edith, Edith Fiore, a doctor of psychology, who was a member of the, of the Dowsing Society, who's given actually, actually lectures to this group. Uh, she told me that um, uh, how she does it, she, she hypnotizes the patient, and then she talks to the spirit inside the patient using the voice box of the patient. And so she communicates one-on-one. -on -one. And she had this patient, uh, this patient that had a uh, a man entity in him, and the entity wouldn't go because he had been a good, no, I'll say a poor Roman Catholic. He had led a bad life in this life, and he knew that these kind of people would go to hell. So he wasn't about to leave the safe sanctuary of this host body. He would stay right there. So she didn't know what to do. She tried thing after item at uh, session after session, trying to get this character to take off. Finally, she hit upon the idea. She created for him a priest. And she asked the priest to come, and she said, now you can see the priest. Immediately the man saw the priest. The priest convinced the spirit that, you no, know, nothing would happen to him, that he would go to a loving place, he would start to learn, he would not be penalized in any way, the way he lost, he lived, and he left. And, of course, the man was free of the, of the spirit. That's just one of the kinds of things. Now, I'd like to describe a process which much of, many of you people know that's uh, important sort of to understand how we communicate. I've divided, not myself but others, have divided our mind into three parts, convenient parts. Naturally they're all one, but we sort of section them out. We have here the conscious mind, the subconscious, and the superconscious mind. First is co the, the conscious mind. This is your thinking mind. This is the mind that you have right now. This is the mind that you feel the chair that you're, you're sitting on. You're aware of the people on both sides of you. You are conscious of some noise here. You're conscious of the heat. All of your five senses are the input <coughs> to this mind. This is the decision-making mind that you have, the critical, the evaluation mind. This is the mind that you're evaluating what I'm saying. Now, but this is not the creative part of your mind. The creative part of your mind is in here, where all of the feelings are, where all the memories, the emotions, love, hate, distress, fears, are all in here. And then the superconscious mind is where all power and all intelligence is everywhere. In other words, everywhere here is, this, is the availability of this power and intelligence to you, because you're part of it. You are not separated from this, this thing at all. Now, there's an interesting thing here. How do we get all the information and intelligence and whatever we want in life? We've got to go here and get it. But we must travel through this road, through our subconscious mind, convince our subconscious mind that we want it, that we deserve it, that we should have it, and we are getting it now. And then there's a communication directly to the superconscious mind. But unless we go here, we can't reach there. Not often. Well, some people can do it, but these are mystics. These are very extraordinary people. And occasionally it will happen in your life, that you'll go directly here. It'll happen. However, when you want to convince your subconscious mind that you want something, then it'll, it, it comes into your awareness, into your reality, as you call it. Right here, it becomes a chair, it becomes this, it becomes a building. 
comes from here. Now, an interesting thing is, the superconscious mind is your mind, your mind, your mind, my mind. If that's so, then you know everything about me, and I know everything about you. Everything. With the pendulum, I can find out everything I want to know about you. I can go into your head and be you. You could do that same thing to me and be me and know what I'm thinking about. So we're really one. We're all one. We're not a bunch of different people. We are one. And knowing that truth or that idea, let's put it that way, you then can get information of any kind in any in any place in the world. You know where that water is, you know where that oil is, you know where that mineral is located, you know where that lost item is, you also know where those lost people are. Because you are those people. So now we're going to use the pendulum in this manner. Before I describe it, we have a little tool here. We have a chart, and you can look in your pages, this is on two locations. <coughs> Your chart is right here on the right side. You can use that. Oh, and it's also on the, um, on the other page here. Up here, same chart. It's the parametric chart developed by Bill Finch, another dowser. Bill's no longer with us, but what he did, he wanted to evaluate uh, applicants for employment for a large corporation, and he developed this idea of trying to find out their characteristics before they were employed. And um, then he discovered that there was something else interfering with this, this, with this uh, um, uh, observation, and he discovered that there were entities involved here. And so he used it to identify entities. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the low, lower part of your chart, by the way, this is a very good chart to keep in your pocket uh, for almost anything you're doing. The lower part of the chart, is divided into 0 to, 50, to 25, 15, and so forth, to 100%. You can use it as a percentage, 0 to 100. You let your pendulum swing, and you get a percentage. <coughs> We're going to do that in a minute. You can also use it as, as a quantity, from 0 to 100. 100 entities, 100 of any kind. Or you may decide to put, instead of 10, you may call it 1, say 0 to 10. So it's a very convenient type of thing. So let's do something right now. Since we know everything about everybody, I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to ask the people, somebody that you don't know, you may be sitting next to you, to give a name of a person, OK? A name of a person, and the age, too. The first name is sufficient. And then I'm going to ask, each one of you, in other words, as a, t as, as a pair, to douse the percentage of health of that person. Well, let's say if I could say it over again. You, you pair up as a, as a team, usually people who don't know each other prefer that, and then give a name to the other person to douse the percentage of health. Now, here's the definition of percentage of health. 100% is the best health that person ever had. Now, what is the percentage of health that person has right now, at this very moment, okay? Now, let's do that right now, and then we'll, we'll compare a few notes, okay? Uh, Any questions? Somebody you don't know. <coughs> now, What you do, relax when you do this. Just relax, let the pendulum go by itself. That's all. It'll go right, it'll be, be correct. After you have done this, then you can reveal, generally, the, if the person is correct or not. 
Not until afterwards, though. <clears throat> yeah, it works good. These these work real good. Mm -hmm. Okay, um I see most of the persons have done this now. Um, about ready to, um, who, who needs more time? Okay, I think we can now continue, if you please. I want you all to compare with each other uh, to tell the, tell the other person how correct they were. You'll find out that they're, they're pretty close to being correct. Can I have your attention now, please? Let's continue. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about the causes of possession. I'd like to talk about the causes of possession. Oh, you people are really enthusiastic over there, I see. With this pendulum. Possession is caused by generally two things. Voluntary possession or involuntary. Involuntary means the person didn't really want it to happen. Voluntary, they cause it to happen in, in some more, um, uh, more positive way. Talk about an involuntary uh, possession. Some years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine. Well, actually, I didn't know him too well. He was I was invited to his home because he was interested in some of the things I was doing. And so, after about an hour of discussion and tell him about the pendulum, the first time you've ever seen a pendulum, and tell him about something you think they're talking to you about, he said, he asked me, he said, what can you tell, about, tell me about my daughter downstairs in the basement? Daughter in the basement? I said to myself, what does the daughter do in the basement? So I said, okay, I'll do that. And so I looked at the pendulum. My goodness sakes, I found that this woman was terribly possessed from just a whole bunch of entities and a few other things I found. And I said to her, to him, I said, she's a mess. She's, she's an alcoholic. She, she's, she's awful. And he said, she's worse than that. He said, she said, uh, he's been down there for a year. Um, I don't know what to do with her. Uh, she has been um, looking at the TV, the Falkland, Falkland War, and she's, she's hiding out because she knows that she's the fiance of, of, King Ch of uh, Prince Charles and his enemies are trying to get, get her. And so it's schizophrenic. So I said, well, okay, I'll take care of her th th that evening. So I did, I threw off these characters in, in my, at my home. The next day she came up and she occupied her bedroom for the first time. And much to the surprise of her father, of course. A few days later, she was found walking around in the snow outside in bare feet in her nightgown. They took her to the hospital. In one month, that woman was almost completely sane, completely lucid in every, in every, in every way. And uh, when she was walking around in the snow like that, she was like Rip Van Winkle, wakening from a deep sleep. 16 years of lost memory in that period of time where she was somewhere else, and, and was somebody else. By the way, I may have believed about this man. He's now an exorcist. I told him a little about a pendulum, and he's now a, a master pendulum, and he's a healer. In fact, he's the president of the pendulum, of the Dobson Society in the Chicago area. So <laughs> he, he really, uh, he really profited. <clears throat> Another type of, uh, of of the uh, causes is the voluntary. This is a person who is on this earth, who's lost somebody and wants somebody perhaps to come, is missing that person a great deal, sorrowful, uh, or um, for some reason they need companionship. Um, there's one lady, for instance, I 
recall she uh, was talking to her on the telephone and uh, it cleared her of a lot of these possessions. She was, she was apparently very lonely, so she would talk to these characters. She could see them and she could talk to them. And um, so I could turn them out and pretty soon she got a whole bunch more. <laughs> and when I just cleared out, when I called her up, I said, How, how's things going? She said, fine. Most of them gone except there's one left. I said, one left? Yeah. He says, and he says, listen to him. He's telling you the truth. I said, you mean I, he can hear me? Sure. He said, okay. I said, put him on. I said, I won't talk to you. I want to talk to him. So I talked to him. And I thought he was a pretty good guy. So I, I cleared him. I exercised him, sent him on his way. And she started laughing. He said, he said goodbye. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a voluntary possession. Also, there's a lady that I, my stepdaughter had a friend whose mother died when she was 11 years old. And the, she was going to get, she was very sick and she was going to have an operation and would I do something? Well, I checked her out and found out this woman, this young lady, while well, she was already, I think she was 26 years old at the time, so that's quite a few years after her mother died, was possessed by one person, one spirit. So I asked the pension, when I said, is it a, a relative? Yep. A family member? Yep. Is it the mother? Yes. Mother. Well, <clears throat> I said, well, mother, you can't be nice, you can't be bad to mothers, you've got to be nice to mothers. <laughs> so I um, said, okay. So what I did, not, not in her presence, by the way, of my stepdaughter, not, no one's present except in my room by myself, I put a chair out, an empty chair. And then, using the law of thought, I projected my thought to this mother, asked the mother to come here, and would she please sit down on this empty chair? Now, I can't see these people. I'm not psychic in this sort, but I knew she was there. So I started to explain to her in a very nice way what was happening to her daughter, that her daughter was ill. In fact, she, the daughter had the same illness that the mother had. In fact, the mother was giving this illness to the daughter. That the mother, the daughter had about six months to live. Then I could feel the shock that they, that, that mother had. And then I, then I explained to her, I said, well, right here is a friend that you can see right now, that you trust and that you, that you have a great deal of respect for. Now you can go with this friend to the next, or to your next dimension, or you can stay with the daughter. I said, it's up to you. See, you, you make the choice. Either go with that friend or stay with the daughter. Now let's go with that. Next week, the daughter canceled her, her, uh, her surgical operation, and has never been ill since. That's about how many years ago? Seven, eight years ago. And she had a dislike for her father, a very, very bad dislike for her father, who had remarried. And of course, the mother was directing that dislike to the father because of that remarriage. And she reconciled with the father after, after that. It was no problem at all. Again, I mentioned before, when you, that's a voluntary possession. She wanted that mother in her mind. She wanted her. She kept her mother. She, in fact, she had an affection for her mother at that time of 80%, which is very, very high. She had an affection for her father about 20%. And her stepmother was just out of the picture entirely. Now I can identify these, and these are not hard to identify uh, on the front page here. You can identify people who may be possessed. We're going to, to work a little bit on that. If there are a person that you know is an alcoholic, almost 100% of them are possessed, spirit possessed, 100%. Drug users, even if it's prescribed drugs sometimes, about 80%. Criminals, over 50%. Um, uh, people who are, who are, let's say, people who, who are very negative, very um, depressed, you can suspect those kind of people of being uh, possessed. Now I'm going to ask you to think of a person that generally fits into these categories that I've just mentioned. Think of a name of a person, and later on, we're going to, I'm going to 
ask for that name, and I'm going to tell you if that person's possessed or not, and then we're going to exercise that person. Then you yourself will see what happens. You yourself will be able to witness the results, particularly if somebody you know uh, who is fairly close to you, uh, where you can observe such a person like that. They don't necessarily have to have all these problems, just maybe two or three, that's enough. Certainly an alcoholic would, would be, a, be a, a qualified person for a thing like that. But keep that in mind, I'm going to ask you at the end of the lecture for that name. Only the first name, not, not more than that. I may add that there are spirit helpers about who will help you in the, anything that you want to do. These are quite evolved evolved um, spiritually and they are not the earthbound type they are the people who are have gained some wisdom and hopefully you people will qualify someday for this position um, these are the people that can help now I have found that I don't do any of this work directly except for the occasionally I'll ask one of these spirits to come when I know it's not going to be a danger dangerous spirit or a very negative spirit but generally speaking, I'm very cautious about this work. I let somebody else do it. So I've adopted, or somebody's adopted me, by the a fellow by the name of George. At least I need him, George, from the expression, let George do it. Well, I'll let George do it. So George is my spirit guide, if you want to call him that. He's my friend. He's, he's, he's the expert at this type of work. So I tell him what to do, and he does it. And that's, that's, that lets me out of the... Off, off, off the hook. Briefly, let me tell you how the spirit, the, how the process is done. First of all, with the pendulum, I identify a spirit, a person of this thing. And I think what we can do now is to do that. With that name, we can. We all full, a lot of full of names. Take your pendulum at this point here. Now, you have a yes and no, no for your pendulum. Some of you have a yes in this direction and a no in this direction, or the circles, whatever you may want to do. First, you take this name in your mind. Let's name, say his name is Hubert, whoever his name is, and ask the question in your mind, is this person spirit possessed? Now, get a yes or no, okay? that after that if the person is spirit possessed ask this question how many spirit entities totally are around this person and in the mind of this person now use this portion of the chart between 0 to 100 so now let your pendulum in the middle and relax just take a deep breath and relax and ask the class the question how many total number of spirits are there around this person and within his mind? Put your pendulum at the center, relax, and let your pendulum swing to a number. And it will. How many of you got some of you people? How, how many did you get? 68. 68, and how many more? 20. 20? 50. 50. Now I may add, those persons who had these high numbers, generally that person's been possessed a long time. The ones in the, in the short numbers or small numbers are probably at a not, say, 15 to 20, hasn't, the duration hasn't been too long. Okay? Okay, now you have that thing. Now, ask the next question. Now, if you will kindly look at this sheet here. And I'm going to read some of these definitions so it puts it in your head as to what it is. The first definition is a minus five has, has little concern for others or truthfulness. You can tell on this page over here, but I'm reading it, for truthfulness. Um, a minus 10 indicates a basically dishonest tendency falling between misdemeanor and felony. And this person may be typically a shoplifter or a petty thief. A minus 15 characterized by being involved in car thefts, robberies, or similar deeds. They beat his wife and children. Now you're getting sort of in the violence area. A minus 20, 
a dangerous criminal, a minus 25, a highly dangerous criminal, and a minus 30, a mass murderer. Now, fortunately, we don't get into this very often. About one in a thousand persons that are possessed fall into this category. I have found about well, eight in the last 8,000 people. So that's a pretty good, pretty good score. We don't want to see too many of these people. So now we've got the definitions on the, in mind. Put your pendulum in the, in the, in the center of, of the circle, relax, and ask who, what is the strongest negative entity within this person's mind? What is the strongest entity in this person's mind? Let your pendulum swing by itself. And after you've got that number, ask the question, what is the next strongest entity in the person's mind? And then you can continue until your pendulum continue continue until your pendulum goes straight up and down in the normal or balanced position. Then you have completed that uh, all of the, you have you have had the answers. You may find as many as five or six in this category down here. Or you may find only one, like I did the other, this lady here. The positive entities are not too much trouble. They don't give you too much trouble, so we don't worry about those people. Mm -hmm. By the way, we're going to exercise all of these people that you have. <clears throat> and now you might as well pick up another, pick up another name. Think of another name, too. We'll take two at a time. We'll make it a wholesale business here. Okay, I see most of you are, are uh, completed. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of my experience using this thing in sort of a, of a spectacular way. Uh, show you, by the way, when you clear these people, Immediately, right afterwards, the person changes. If he's an alcoholic, he's going to stop drinking. If he's using drugs, he's going to stop using drugs. If he's, if he's violent, he's going to be the sweetest guy in the world. Everything that this guy did is going to stop right then. It's not going to be, continue anymore because he no longer has the person within himself telling him what to do. Gone. He may be a little lost for a while, but that's uh, another matter. I was given a lecture like this to about the same kind of group, you, uh, group like you are, in uh, Riverside, California. This goes back a few years. And um, I seen something on TV about some sort of a criminal on the loose and giving a lot of trouble to people. And uh, I didn't, get, didn't catch it all, and I asked my audience a little bit about that. And they said, oh, that's a night stalker. He killed 14 women. He'd come in there harping and strangle them or kill them in some way after rape. And there was quite a uh, fear uh, among the people that this man was, uh, was still on the loose. I said, let's find out about this man. So we did exactly what, what you did there. I uh, used the pendulum and found out he had two minus 25 entities on his mind. These are the people who were controlling him. Two highly dangerous will kill with the slightest provocation for a little reason. Okay, so let's exercise them right now. So we exercise this fellow, that's what I'm going to do in a little while. And I told the audience, my audience, that either one of two things will happen. This man will completely disappear, nobody will hear from him again, nothing will happen, no more killings, nothing. Or he will be caught very quickly. Well, as it turned out, and a week afterwards, he was identified, and a week after that, he tried to steal a car from a woman in broad daylight, young lady in broad daylight, with all kinds of people around. He was wrecked, she, she screamed, she put up a fuss, because she recognized who he was. The people recognized who, who he was. They caught him and beat him, almost beat him to death. He no, he no longer had the cunning and intelligence to do his usual act. He was apparently not very good fellow in the first place. 
A friend of mine is uh, lives in in uh, <clears throat> Oregon. He he wrote to me one day. He says, "Gee, he says, what can you do about this Green River killer that's uh, on the loose right now?" And I said, "Well, I don't know. Let's check him out." Well, this man, my pendulum indicated, he had killed 47 women, mostly prostitutes, young women, and had dumped their bodies in the Green River. So he's called the Green River Killer. He said, okay, check him out. And I, he had, he had a minus 30. In other words, his, his was what's called a mass murderer. He killed, uh, will kill for the love of killing, needs no reason to kill, nor will anything of a moral nature dissuade him from killing. Like to kill. So, we got rid of that minus 30. He disappeared. There's been no word, no killings after that. Not one, no clue as to who he was or anything. But there's been no killing since that time. And yet, it seemed like we stopped him. It seemed like it. Some of the more amusing things are, I was um, having dinner with a fellow by the name of Marcus Bach and a friend of mine, uh, an engineer, and the subject of uh, hijacking t came up. Hijacking in Lebanon, not Lebanon, uh, uh, Tehran. A uh, plane had landed there, an American plane had landed there, and the and hijackers were killing the passengers. And they had threatened to kill some more. And I said, and then during the conversation it came up, and I said, oh, I, I can do something about that. So that evening, I took the pendulum, and I asked the question, um, how many, hij how many hijackers are there? And I came to four. And by the way, there were four. Then we checked them for possession. And we found only one among that group, there were two possessed, but only one who could kill. He had a minus 25. See, they can't, you can't kill unless you have this, this urge to, to do these things. So we cleared him. And then we did another thing. We gave a treatment for harmony to exist between the hijackers and the passengers, between the hijacker and the crew members, and the hijacker with all the people around that plane who had anything to do with the plane. The next morning, this blew over, they surrendered, and that was the end of it. No violence, nothing at all. No more killing, of course. We've done it, I've done it to a number of other uh, hijacking, and it's all been the same results. So what you can do, you can defuse these kind of fantastic um, uh, situations. And probably the one that I, now by the way, I can't prove any of this. You know, I cannot prove this stuff. But if you're continually doing it and you find, and you can tell your friend what's going to happen, and it does happen, then you, you understand. Yes, sir? When you uh, remove an enemy, especially a very critical, say, a mass murder type of death, uh, you talk about getting help. Well, look. Well, let me tell you a story then about that. I, I'll have to take questions after the uh, after the session, but nevertheless, I'll tell you a story about that. I didn't do this before. I didn't have a helper before. I thought, well, I was I was you know egotistical enough to take care of it myself. I didn't know what I was going to get in get up to, get up, get up against. And so I read about a murderer, mass murderer, by the name of Bonin, in the, um, Bonin, Bonin, his name I think it was, who was in California, who was called the Freeway Killer, because he dumped 41 bodies of young men and women, uh, young men and boys, on the highway, freeway. They finally caught him. And I thought, well, this guy uh, got a problem. So I found out he had a minus 30 on him, which was this mass killer. I said, I'll take care of you, buddy. And so I zapped him, see. I thought I did a good job. Well, the next couple of days, I said, this fellow here is in bad shape. I think I'll give him some healing. And then I took a deep breath, and I smelled the most horrible odor in my living room that I could imagine. I couldn't believe that, that terrible odor I, I smelled. And I looked around the room. What's going on here? And then I took another deep breath, and I smelled it again. Then I remembered something. A friend of mine had gone into a, who was an exorcist, had gone into a home where four people had committed 
suicide in one room. And he went into the, to this room. It was a bare room with closets, windows, nothing, hardly anything in the room. And he smelled this horrible odor. And he recognized it as being that entity in it. One of those terrible things. He said, he said that, that demon, he called, he said, I won't have anything to do with it. And he ran away with it. He ran away. He would have nothing to do with it. And then I recognized what was going to happen, who what that was. At that time, I had a heart problem, and I had a terrible angina pain, just a terrible angina pain. And I put the white light around myself, did the exorcism. I thought I had it made. The next morning, before I woke up, I had a dream. It wasn't a dream. It was something else, I'm sure. And I saw him. I recognized him right away, who he was. He was a guy about 5 foot uh, 10, about 130 pounds. This little guy, white shirt, black pants, with the most horrible expression on his face. I could not duplicate this expression of hatred as a, a complete malevolence on his face. And he came rushing toward me, and it takes a little something to get me scared. And I stood my, my, my ground and threw a white light on him. <coughs> then I continued that process when I, when I woke up. It was, it was a complete, a continuous process. <coughs> He almost killed me, because my heart was going about 250. I don't know, it was going very high, going very fast. So at that time, I'd like to find George. George would take care of the deal. I, I threw this out. I don't want you to be frightened of this kind of thing, but I, I do want to caution you about it, because you're dealing with some really strong negative characters. Uh, there was a time when people didn't know these things, and they got, they got the guy. The guy, the guy got on, on them. Um, I want to talk to you about a strange thing that happened, and as I say, I can't prove this. But I read an article about Gaddafi making a statement after the, uh, the, uh, the terrorist had gunned down about 50 people at the LL airline counter at Rome and in Vienna. He made a statement, he praised their heroic deed of killing all these people. Gaddafi, of course, is the president of Libya. And I thought to myself, how could anybody praise murder of this kind? There's something wrong here. Sure enough, I checked Gaddafi. Gaddafi had a minus 15. He was a violent man. And so I cleared him. And I told my friends, I said, watch, this guy's going to reverse himself. A few days later, in the Christian Science Monitor, there was an article. Gaddafi reverses himself. Have nothing to do with terrorists. And you know, this is, I don't know how many years ago, it was four or five years ago now, there has not been one case of terrorism uh, attached to Gaddafi, in any way connected with Gaddafi. There's not anyone, that any, place, any article I've ever read since that time that Libya has been involved with, with, with uh, terrorism. And I don't know if you can any, any of you know any differently of that, but that's what I found out. And I don't think, I, don't, I think Gaddafi has, is, is a completely changed man since that time. And again, I can't prove it. But you can try some of these things. Now, there's uh, two areas that I like to talk about. One is called negative energies. Negative energies are these energies that are projected from one person to another, usually. And they're very harmful extremely harmful, and they exist. And we're talking about all kinds of invisible things here, spirits and thoughts, and, but believe me, they're real. Now, an example of, of say, negative energies was a, a lady who was, whom I knew was a widow. She had a 14-year-old daughter. And every time a kid came from home, from school, came home, she would berate her mother, tell her mother all kinds of nasty things, and. Uh, the poor mother, she, she was at her wit's end. That brat of hers was forever giving her a hard time. And that terrible child was, what could she do with her? I heard this for several weeks. And finally, I said, wait a second. I know what the problem is. And so I told the mother, I said, now look it. We're going to change things. But you've got to change your thinking. So I said, look it. From now on, I want you to say to, to your daughter in your mind that she's a good kid, great person, Perfect in every respect. Oh, an okay person. Every time you think you see her, in fact is, even if, the, even if it's not so, this is how you think. 
Well, you know, uh, one month later, she came to me and she said, Oh, has my daughter changed? Oh, she's the sweetest thing in the world. We get along beautifully. Kid's now going to, she's a, she's a senior, a, a junior in college, and it's been great since that time. She was hexing her daughter, or she was throwing negative energies on her daughter. Now, hexing itself is not a bad thing when it's used properly. Now, now the witch doctors in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Caribbean, um, this is one of their duties to do this. You see, in some, some areas of these backward countries, there is not sufficient uh, civil protection. The courts do not reach in those areas. And people get away with things, with a lot of mischief. So it's a duty of the witch doctor to control those kind of people. So what he does, he puts a hex on them. Puts a hex on them, and pretty soon, this person who has done these, these bad things will find that he, his wife walks out on him, the children get sick, the car gets stolen, he breaks his leg. All kinds of terrible things happen to this fellow who's been hexed until he changes his way, asks for forgiveness or make restitution. So it's a, it's a duty of these people to do it. Unfortunately, this kind of thing is being practiced to a large extent in this country. A lot of these people are now coming over and using either legally or illegally and doing this type of thing. And so I've noticed this kind of thing happening to a lot of people, not too many about from the people I examine, about one person in 50 who, are, who have, kinds of, have serious problems have this hex on them. Now, it puzzled me for a long while as to how to remove a hex, because that's, it's got to be done. And there is, no, there is no literature on it. There's no place you can read about it. I wrote, I wrote to, a, well, in fact, to talk to Marcus, and I, Marcus Bach, and I, he wrote a book on it. And I said, where can I get the book? So I read the whole book, and not one word as to how this thing was done on Buddhism, until I got a hint from another source, and then it came to me exactly how it should be done. What the Buddha doctor does, he places a lot of feeling here, a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion in in revenge or let's say um, uh, negative thoughts toward the person. He may even take drugs. He may get exhausted. He may take, he may take, uh, he may have drums to, uh, to get him to a state where he's completely in this area and he can project these thoughts to the, to the individual. As soon as that, he's part here, as soon as he's done that, this other man is part of this, and now reacts towards it. So what do you suppose is the way to remove the hex? Is to use the same kind of method that was put on. Use a great deal of feeling, a great deal of emotions, in a positive manner to remove it. Now here's how I do this. I try to do it visually so that it gets some sort of, uh, of a, of a, of a say, a place where I can put my hands on. I see this person who has his hex, and I see him with a dark cloud. In fact, I can't see him. It's a big, dark cloud around him, smoky, dirty cloud. And then I visualize this dark cloud rising up, turning to a purple, then to a violet, and then returning the energy, returning to the center in the form of love. And I feel these things as I do, do it. I feel that thing happen. I feel the love going back in this direction. And then I immediately focus upon the person there, and there he is, no cloud, the cloud's gone. And I see a bright light up around this person, and I know it's done. Now, let me tell you a little secret here. As soon as you concentrate, any type of concentration, you are definitely in here. That's how you can tell you're here in the so-called alpha level. You spoke about it, which you... Uh, as soon as you concentrate, your, your mind definitely is into, into this area. So you're okay. You do it. The final, uh, the final important 
Oh, let's see, I got some more. No, yeah. The final important thing that I'd like to talk about is harmony. Harmony, you get a lot of situations, and I'm sure you're going to be involved in this in some way or another, in which you have situations of people who are fighting each other or have a bad feeling towards each other. Well, it's important that this kind of thing be, be how do you say, smooth out, be healed. I have found that uh, one, of the most, one of the most important things I can do after I've cleansed people of these entities is to give a treatment for harmony. And here's how I do it. I visualize this person standing in a circle of his friends, family, uh, close associates. I, now I feel all these things as I do it now. I see them and I feel their love for each other, their joy, their gladness of being with each other. I, I think and feel their understanding one for the other, that they know that they're understood by the other. I feel that they are all trying to help each other, that they are not judgmental, that they forgive, that they trust each other. All these feelings and emotions I try to feel myself. And then I feel, I see a tremendous feeling of harmony existing among this group of people. And, I, and they are thankful for it and let it go. Now I discovered this many years ago. And I don't, can't prove this either. But during the war I was in Normandy and I, um, it was, um, I think, the 4th of July, 4th of July or 6th of July. And at that period of time in Normandy, the, the Americans were trying to break out. The Germans were resisting, resisting terribly, everything they had. And uh, I was laying a, 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 a telephone line from the rear to the front, and I really was dodging these, these mortar shells as they fell, and the machine gun bullets was all over the place. It was... Um, it was sort of like a snake, snake trip to the front line, trying to get the telephone line in. And I finally got to the, to, the, to the end of the line, and by the time I got there, my whole line had been shot off behind me. I put in my telephone, of course, there was no, no, no uh, nothing. And by golly, it was a very noisy place to be. I never want to go to another 4th of July like that. There was, these shells were falling, and it was, uh, it was a very bad place. And, Companies were cut down from 180 men to 20 men, from 180 men to 40 men. Men just to be wiped out entirely in, in, in this particular area. And I thought, well, gee, more, you're not going to live through this day. You're, you're going to, this is it. So I said, before I, before I get, get it, I'm going to sit down and I'll read all these letters in my pocket. Kelly, I haven't read six, six letters in my pocket I received for a week. I haven't got these letters. I'm going to read them right now. And then I don't care what happens. So I sat down next to a hedgerow, and I started pulling out the letters, reading the letters. And this letter, and that was a pretty good letter. It's from my wife, and I, she told them all about my kids, and the kid in there, I, well, that's fine. And so I put on another letter, and start reading that letter, too, and pay no attention to anything. And I finally finished the sixth letter, and I looked up. There was no sound, not a sound anywhere. It was all, every, there were 30,000 men trying to kill each other, half an hour ago and not a sound could I hear the whole war stopped and I had, uh, had a feeling here that I didn't know about that later until until later I every time I'd come to the front line the war would stop and I thought well, that's great you know I don't have to do anything the war stopped got here too late um, but later on I, I have a feeling that what happened here is that that little 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 uh spot of harmony, peace, sort of did this. And the whole bloody front stopped, stopped shooting each other. And then I have discovered that that kind of thing can be useful in many, many kind of situations. When you are peaceful, when you are harmonious, this will operate all the way around you. Okay, folks, that's about all on, on that subject. Now, what I have now, I want you to Give me the name, the first name of an individual who has these characteristics. I'll read them again to you. Um, 
uh, alcoholic, drug user, criminal, violent, depressive, negative, chronically ill. Just give me the first name only, and I will try to tell you. I'll, I'll go. I'll start in the back, and I'll just go right down the line for everyone. Everyone's going to get get a name at least. Okay. And uh, then we're going to a, an actual a deep procession. Okay, fine. Okay, can I begin with you, please? Uh, Patrick. Patrick. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, please. Roland. Roland? Herman. I didn't hear that name. Uh, Herman. Herman. A little bit, yes, but not too much. Go ahead. Next person, please. Uh, oh, yes. I don't, didn't even hear the name, but I, yes. That, please. No. Next one, please. You, sir. Herman. Yes. Marion. Yes, but not too much. Um, let's see, where can we get the next row? Right there, yes. Uh, Roland. Roland? Roland? Yes. Um, you have one? No. Olive, did you say? Holly. Holly. Yes. On drugs. This one, please. What? Yes. Laura? Yes. Yes and no. I'm not sure about that one. Okay, I'll go back to you later. Please. Great. Yes. Hank. Yes. Uh, yes. Sir. What is that name? Sarah. I don't know. Lisa. Yes. Where are you? Yes. Anita. No. Cindy. Yes. Oh. Yes. Hell. Hell yes. Very much so. David. Yes. Victor. Yes. Great. No. George. Yes, not much. Oh. Yes. Rodney. I didn't hear that name. Rodney. Yes. You see what I'm doing? I'm going from the conscious mind by pointing, pointing to you. I'm going into the subconscious mind by relaxing. I'm going into the alpha state. Then I'm asking the question, is this person possessed, yes or no? And it comes, yes or no? And sometimes the impression comes to me very strong, like I said to the gentleman back here, very much so. And uh, this, this is sort of, you, you do it many times. Where do I left off here? I need that. Yes. Ricky? Yeah. Eddie. Yeah, he's on drugs, that one. Go ahead. Steve. Yes. I am. Yes. Um, no. Julie. Yes. Tony. Yeah, no. Pete. I don't know. Let's go back to you, sir. What's that name again? Sir. Yes, I got a yes on that one. Okay, now, sir. And how? Very much so. Okay. All right. Yes. Aaron. Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Not 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 very much, but he is. Yes. 
the stronger the impression I get, the more serious is the condition. Uh, that's what I have found from my own experience. Okay, now here's what we're going to do. Um, just listen to what I have to say. I'm going to again tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to contact George. I'm going to tell him what to do. We're going to be real nice to these guys, these, these spirits. We're not, going to, we're not going to be rough with them at all. We're going to, be, we're going to give them a good opportunity to go peacefully. If they don't go peacefully, uh, they're going to regret it. Put it that way. Okay? Okay. Um, what I want you to do now is to think of the person whom I had mentioned to you. Even if I gave you a no, it would make a bit of difference. It, you, could still, you could still work on this, this person. Just think of what I'm saying. If you want, you can close your eyes. If you can concentrate more, that's what I'm going to do. It's simply it's concentration, nothing more than that. I'm not in any trance. Um, I can concentrate better this way. George, I'd like you to, um, uh, to take care of these spirits that are bothering these people. Can you identify them? Okay, I had a feeling that George got hold of all these people. I don't know how he does it, but I don't care about it. George, please explain to these, these spirits who they are and where they are, that they're no longer of the earth plane, that they're on the other side of the curtain called death. They feel very much alive and it's perfectly okay, but they do not belong here. They belong to a far better place. They're causing trouble to themselves, they're causing trouble to the people they're with, and they must leave. Nearby each one of them, there's a friend whom they see, whom they, uh, they respect, and for whom they have a great deal of trust. Now this friend will now take them to their next level of development and healing and truth, where they will be given care, guidance, instruction, where their every need will be supplied. Above all, they'll be among those whom they love and who love them on the same side of the curtain of death as they're on. Suggest to them, George, as they think about these loved ones, those who have died. They see these loved ones. They're there. They're as real as can be. They can feel them. They can see how solid they are. They're surrounded with all their friends. Now, Go with these friends to the light, to the open doorway there. Okay, George, for those entities who were so unwise as not to accept the terms just given to them, now they now find themselves in a small, black, uncomfortable box, squeezed tight with nails sticking in it. They can remain in that box away from all human and living creatures forever, unless and until they accept the terms just given to them. They have three seconds to make up their mind. Either they go with a guide or stay there in the box. One, two, three, go! And that is the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now. <laughs> Believe me, you people will be able to see what's happened. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. The question is, if I go to old cemeteries, uh, what will we find there? Unfortunately, when a person dies and it becomes earthbound, they stay in a cemetery near where they're buried, or in the hospital that they are, they died in, or in a home that's comfortable to them, even if they've never lived there before. Somebody was describing to me a new home that was just built that was occupied by a lady of, I think her name, 28 years old, a, a spirit. They'll go where they're comfortable. And the trouble is, the ones who are, who are troublesome will go to the bars, will go to places like that where people will become obsessed. You can get a whole bunch of bad ones there. Um, does anyone want to find out by their pendulum how many spirits are in this room right now? Uh, could you do that, uh, I believe? Um, he's going to get an expert here. We're going to use, ask him to do it.
see the spirit. 30, 30 and 40. 30 and 40. See what happens. When we start talking about these things, we become, they be, they're very much interested in it. So they're lining the walls, they're right here listening to this lecture. They, they, they enjoy it as much as you do, see. Um, but that's, for people of, who are involved in psychic, as you people are, you've got to be very careful, very, very careful. These are the people, these groups are the people that are most possessed of all the people I talk to. You must be very careful about being uh, involved. You have to be able to protect yourself. The best way to protect yourself in this kind of a, a, an environment is to visualize a sun within the center of your being and that sun expanding. You can all do that now. Close your eyes a moment. Visualize a sun in the center of your body expanding outward, just expanding right out. And that is your protection. That's all done. Um, they also are in churches. I went to a um, to almost every church, particularly the old church, you find six to seven hundred of them, of people inside there who are spirits, uh, in a cemetery in the thousands in this, this area. In Europe, I found one with 7,500. They're also in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the shorelines of the ocean that have been sunk. Um, she she mentioned that she went on a, on a trip with a on a on a voyage on a, sh on a ship and uh, there was many many what hundreds probably in on that ship. Are any other questions, please? Yes, sir. You sounded you talked to me a statement that when a person dies, uh, their life passes in front of them and they yes. see that the things that they should have done. Uh, and so on, how to progress. Now, uh, if, uh, I'm wondering if maybe a person should be, out, should be an alcoholic, and uh, if you're getting in a car and stuff like this here, and uh, I'm wondering, uh, uh, this isn't being facetious, but where do you feel that you should step in since this person didn't ask for your help? And, uh, All right, let me, everyone has free will. Everyone has free will. You have free will. You all have free will. When you have these other characters, they are interfering with your feel free will. You have not asked them to come into you, your life. They have taken over your, 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 your mind. They are interfering with you. Throw them out. If you want them back again, ask them to come in. But they don't belong here. In fact is, they themselves, you're, you're helping them. I think I have more of a consideration for the spirits in this room than I do for the alcoholic or for the person who is in trouble like that. The fellow who is who's in the, the person who is an alcoholic and doing all kinds of mischief to criminals, I don't have much sympathy for those people, but I do have a lot of sympathy for the spirits that they, that they, they're lost, really lost. It's a matter of telling these people where to go. Uh, does that answer your question? Well, what happens when this person, uh, you get rid of the same 15 entities? Yeah. Uh, is there a void there that all of a sudden there's 15 other hungry entities that want to get in and they jump right in? So no, not so. Look at, look at, unfortunately, there are billions of these, these spirits here on this earth. You, know, you, you can't run out of it. Nexus can't run out of these spirits. There are so many of them. Um, like we've attracted 38 or so here. What he's saying is about that individual. What about the boy in that individual? Oh, no. The person becomes perfectly natural. He becomes himself. For the first time, maybe in years. His good, natural self. He stops beating his wife. He stops all kinds of things. He stops drinking. He stops doing... becomes a real human, human being. A question back there first, please. Then I'll take you. Yes, the, she mentioned here this lady was an alcoholic and on drugs was she and she had a car accident all of a sudden she changed her life. Okay, here's what happened, more than likely what happened. And I'll explain it to another analogy. The two types of people or two professions that are most possessed are psychiatrists and dentists. What happens, a person is possessed, and the drill is hits the person's mouth, 
The pain is so intense, the entity takes off. He doesn't like to feel that. He feels it. He takes off, and where do you suppose it goes on to? That dentist. The psychiatrist does the same thing with electric shock, shock treatment. Sure, the spirit takes off, but where does he go? Psychiatrist. If the psychiatrist is a little bit down in, 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 in health. And more than likely, what happened there, could have happened, is that the spirits who were there took off. They, didn't, they couldn't stand that pain. I'm sorry, Ken, it's too much. I'm sorry, I just can't hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. If, if somebody were to work on your scale, yes. instead of murdering other people, could they come suicidal and stand turn that against the dog? Well, you see, you've got to be very careful. In other words, you're asking if your if spirit is removed, if we as the Nexus remove the spirit, could it go on us? Of course it could. That's what I've been trying to tell you. You've got to be very careful. Go through another, go through a... Scale, right. Mass yeah. Instead of hurting other people, could they turn that to the cells and become suicidal? Oh, yes. Like yes. Yes. Uh, the question was, these entities who are in this category of minus 20 or minus 30, whoever they may be, can they hurt the host body? Of course they can. The fact is, if they're a minus 20 or greater, I can tell right away that the person's suicidal. And I'll so state it. This person is suicidal and almost every time it will be verified. The entity within the person wants to kill that host. Get out. He got in and he can't get out. So he wants to kill the host and he'll talk to that host like this. You're no good. You're rotten. Everything you do is lousy. The best thing for you is get off this earth. Kill yourself. The person will hear that over and over and over again and then First opportunity will kill himself. Almost every suicidal is done in this manner. Actually, I do oftentimes, many times, state on my on my report, which I report every time I do these, I report completely to the person who's asked for the uh, uh, the work to be done. I report this person's suicidal, and, uh, and almost always I mean or something, whatever it is. You have a question here, I believe. Yes. If this, if you remove the spirit and like, is this kind of a band-aid thing? Will they come back, or is there any way to, no. uh, like, a follow-up to make sure? No, these, uh, the, the individual spirits that are removed are gone forever. They're no longer here at all. But the person, would they be likely to attract more, or if they didn't know? If they, for instance, let, let, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this. So you remove a whole bunch of these spirits. The person, he, he's, he doesn't know about these things, and all this thing, he doesn't like to drink anymore. So he, lays off drinking or he doesn't care about that company that he's been having before or he's stopping, uh, stopping his drugs or he's stopping his bad habits whatever. he may not notice it but the people around him will see the tremendous change that's come over this person but he may slip take another drink somebody urges him to drink just because of habit then he'll pick up some other entities but not so quite so bad so what I do when I, when I get a list of these people, I check them out, clean them out, and then check them out for a total of 90 days. So if they slip, hit them again. Slip, hit them again. And put them on another 90-day uh, period. Until I get 90 days them completely clear, then they're home free. Mm -hmm. You have a question, sir. Yes. Um, the entity that's trying to do away with hope. Yeah. If the host does die or commit suicide or whatever, what happens to the entity? Oh, he's free. He's free. For not only that, he's free to go to somebody else. So when you have a man who's been executed, there's a man just executed in the state of Illinois, I believe, just recently, uh, well, a month or so ago, and he was bravado. Hey, he don't care about anything. So you're going to kill me? Don't care about it all. See, that was his whole, whole facade. The night before he was executed, I said, well, no use letting this entity, these entities go with him and be freed and go on somebody else, kill some more people. So I cleared him. He had some very bad ones on him. I cleared him out. 
and suddenly he changed. He became, you know, every, a completely different person. And he went to the execution, now no longer with great bravado. But I did that primary, I didn't have much sympathy for him. I did that because I wanted to get that entity not to be free to do more damage. Some of these are around for thousands of years, one after the other person. And they cause a tremendous amount of, of, of ter terrible things. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, are there any entities that are here for uh, a positive purpose, that are helpful, that are beneficial, and should be here? The question is, are there some good entities around? There's a lots of good entities around, and most of them are good, but they don't belong here. They so belong they to a higher... They should all go because they, there is so much more for them to go to, so much more, so, many, so much more education, so much more teachers, so, much, so many more things for them to, to evolve up to. And, but they, those who are here, not necessarily are wicked, they simply don't know where to go. They're lost. See? And believe me, these, these earthbound entities can't do you a darn bit of good. They're no smarter than they were when they died. Uh, <laughs> they're the same as anybody else. So don't ask them to come around. Another question? Yes? I just have one more. Do you think that we are having more entities around like we're having more other things? I think we're becoming more aware that they are here. I think they've always been here. Uh, I think there's been, um, we are becoming more and more aware of, of what's going on in the, in the spirit world than we've ever had before in the whole history of our, of our civilization. Uh, I know that uh, eight, nine years ago when I first heard the word exorcism, I would never have any, anything to do with it. And today I wrote a book on it. But uh, uh, I think that's maybe the answer to your question. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a very wonderful audience.